Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Ask the Theologian. I'm glad to see you today uh, here for our uh, Friday broadcast. Uh, and d- does it look dark, Nathan, or is it just because I'm wearing a dark suit that uh, changed uh, changed everything? It just seems a little dark in my monitor there. Uh, we don't want to have a dark Friday the 13th, do we? Glad uh, you're here, and uh, we are going to close out the week here with... Uh, uh, hopefully a good uh, Ask the Theologian, and um, uh, I've, t- I've told you, I think, about, but let me just whet the appetite again for this, the Rightly, <coughs> Rightly Divided Commentary Series. Volume one of the series is Titus and Philemon. This will be the first of the uh, Blue Letter Edition, actually out in print, and uh, that's uh, in the layout right now. Done the uh, the uh, the writing, the editing, ready to go. Uh, we'll uh, uh, see if we can get that out uh, soon. And then this Sunday, May the fifteenth, we have uh, this sermon: Should Christians Fast in the Because You Ask series, and uh, that'll uh, <coughs> be a little fun to take. Uh, so, welcome. See all uh, chiming in this morning, uh, coming in. Let's see, got a little question uh, uh, on the docket uh, from uh, Jim in Piedmont. Um, and uh, let's, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, that one's a comment. It's not every now and then a comment jumps over into the question side. Um, the, here's one from Charles. Um, ah, go, a good uh, lightning round question. Uh, Stephen, huh, interesting. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll check the whole thing there, but Stephen in Florida, a uh, good one. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, uh, yeah. So, uh, so there we, there we go. We get, that means we've got room for questions today. Uh, so uh, it's a good Friday. Uh, what have you got? Have you got a, an M&M question, ministry and mentoring questions? Have you got a lightning round question? You just want to boom, boom, boom. Uh, those are, those are kind of nice to fill in at the end when I'm looking over there and say, hey, I got three minutes left in this 28 and a half minutes. Uh, what do I do? Uh, I can either extend for three minutes, which I'm pretty good at, or I can uh, give a quick answer for three minutes, which I'm not so good at, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we uh, look at those and uh, try to go with them. So, uh, or maybe you just have a, um, uh, a, a good biblical, theological worldview question, and uh, we will take those good biblical, theological, and worldview questions as we join together for this today. If you're watching, watching, If you're watching, I'll get it out here. If you're watching on YouTube, put the word question right at the front. If you're watching on Randy White Ministries, use that little question box. If you're watching on Worshify, use the little question box. They pop up a little different, but they're both there. Uh, If you are on uh, askthetheologian.com, which is our newest website, uh, then uh, you can uh, go on uh, Ask the Theologian. And uh, there's a little uh, right up here in the corner, ask the theologian, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I'll get it right, ask a question box, uh, working on uh, a few things uh, here. Uh, yesterday didn't quite uh, fill in all the way, but uh, uh, we'll get uh, all that uh, fixed. And uh, look, you just go down through these 3,539 questions. Just pick one there. I'll stop that. That's yesterday's. You got the... Uh, uh, the, the transcript there. And, uh, then, uh, you know, the transcript just, uh, just for that question now, number of, I'll stop uh, that. Uh, and then you can go on. If you want to keep reading, you can read the uh, full transcript right there. Uh, you can edit and we appreciate, uh, when you edit, for example, go right here, edit this page. And we don't need that right there. Tech right there. That was uh, issue. It was a tech question. But uh, do that and say, hey, yeah, that looks better. Submit (laughs) changes and it'll go to an admin who'll say, yeah, good, good call. Good call there, Randy. Um, Let's make that change. And they will approve that. So appreciate those volunteer admins and (coughs) a, a world of volunteers. That's you 
who make the changes on that because that uh, enables, it's all computer driven. It just feeds into the computer. And so, uh, you know, if you, the way you type your question, that's the way it's going to get in there. And some of you need an editor, you know, <laughs> kind of like I do. And, uh, the transcript is all computer generated, so every now and then, uh, you know, Worship Pie comes out as Worship Pie. Uh, everybody needs some Worship Pie. Hey, let's have some cherry pie and some Worship Pie. Uh, and uh, so you begin to make those changes in the transcript. And those, as, you're, as you're doing, anybody can do it. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the people's website right there. <laughs> so check that out. Uh, always appreciate it. Um, uh, appreciate that. Okay, now uh, let's, uh, with that, let's uh, jump into a, uh, uh, a, a 28 and a half minutes. I'm going to go ahead and take a cough drop here. Stick it back in the corner of the mouth. Try to keep the cough down as uh, we go through. And at the end of the 28 and a half minutes, you know how it works. Stay tuned, even though I say the program's over. You stay tuned because we'll give it the full hour here uh, on the, the internet program. But let's dive in to the television program. I'll be back in just a few seconds. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Randy White, and this is Ask the Theologian, where we take your biblical, theological, and worldview questions. We'd love for you to put your question in at askthetheologian.com. And we start today with a question as we take our questions rightly divided, trying to give uh, uh, an answer from the scriptures rightly divided. And uh, we start today in Piedmont, South Carolina. As uh, Jim says, how do you reconcile 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 32 with Exodus chapter 20, verse uh, 4? Now, this is uh, one of these issues. I've, I've jumped on this a little bit before. And uh, it's, it's, it's one of the, uh, oh, I would say a, a somewhat challenging issue in reconciling these two scriptures. Let's go ahead and look at them. Let's start with the Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, since that comes first in the scripture. And it says, uh, upper right-hand corner of your screen here, thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I am the Lord God, I am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children and to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Now, this, of course, uh, is uh, the uh, Ten Commandments and uh, the, uh, what, second of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not make of thee any graven images. Now, any graven image. That's Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 6, verse uh, 32. And uh, here we have this instruction. The two doors also were of olive tree, and he carved upon them carvings of cherubims and palm trees and open flowers and overlaid them with gold and spread gold upon the cherubims and upon the palm trees. Now, here uh, we're talking about uh, the temple and the, uh, the doors of the temple, if I'm not mistaken, we're talking about the temple here. Uh, here uh, in uh, this uh, particular uh, building, I believe the temple, we've got uh, the, the carvings. Now, I do know that the Jewish people always, I'm not exactly sure how they would um, qualify this, but uh, from Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, uh, any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in earth beneath or that is on of the water. Uh, they, they never took that to be a problem with plants, let's say. And plants and geometric shapes. Normally, if you are walking through Israel and uh, you're um, an armchair archaeologist and you look over and uh, here's a, a carving, perhaps it's a column or 
uh, uh, some sort of a piece that obviously came out of a building and it's carved, or a piece of artwork, a piece of mosaic, something like this, and you see geometric shapes, or you see flowers, or you see fruit. You might often see pomegranates, for example. And when you see these things, you almost immediately would say, as an armchair archaeologist, you would say, ah, that's Jewish material, because the Jews don't put faces, people, animals. Those things are off limits because of the Ten Commandments. But here, if we were to stumble across these, let's take a trip to Israel, and uh, lo and behold, we're going along, and we stumble across uh, some ancient wooden doors, two of them, of olive tree, that's of olive wood, and carved upon them were, let's skip chair beam, uh, palm trees, open flowers. Ah, this is Jewish material. This is just plants. And um, I know of, I could be wrong here, but I know of no culture, certainly not the Jewish culture, that ever worshipped plants as an idol. So that was never really seen as a problem. But here, it does have the cherubims. Now, cherubims, often today, uh, in more modern English, we would just say cherubim, just using the transliteration of the Hebrew rather than anglicizing it with the S on it. But uh, cherubims or cherubim are more than one cherub. These are angels, angelic beings. And so here you've got, on the doors, you've got living beings. Well, how do you reconcile this? I think you reconcile it in one of two ways. One is looking at the context of it here, and, and we won't be able to fully answer it because we won't uh, be able to look at, fully look at the context. Looking at the context here, we would have to say, okay, was there an instruction of God to do this? Because you remember within the temple itself, in the Holy of Holies, there were cherubs, cherubim, and uh, they had their wings outstretched, and they were instructed to do so. In fact, that's true also with the, uh, uh, with the draperies, with the pomegranates on them in terms of plant life. So uh, God said, make no graven images, but if God said, make this graven image, then I suppose that uh, you, you would have to listen to God. So is there anything here in which we would be able to take and say, yeah, this, this is an, an, a direct instruction from God, and so God can make the instructions however he wants. That's one possibility. Another possibility is you say, ah, this is just a man as an artist that has come along, and in his desire to do that which is beautiful, he has uh, done that which is sinful. And this can happen <coughs> even right at the temple doors. We can take that which is well-meant, I say we, we're not under the law, fortunately. We can take that which is well-meant, we mankind, and beautiful, no doubt, I'm sure these uh, doors were beautiful with their chair beam and their palm trees and their open flowers and overlaid with gold, um, and that which is beautiful, and yet, and, and even presented to God, and yet, yeah, this is, this is not what God wanted. This is not God-honoring. The, the temple, you remember, was, was built on man's design, whereas the tabernacle was built upon God's design. This, if I'm assuming correctly again, is the first temple, which was man's design. The second temple, even more so man's design, especially by the time you got to the, the Herodian uh, position of that temple. And they added and they did these things to... to uh, to where eventually even God's glory left the temple. So there is the possibility that you don't reconcile these things. You say, here's a Jew who somehow in his mind made the idea that because a cherub is a heavenly being, that we could put the cherubim on there. Now, the, the one other possibility is if you could somehow determine that Exodus chapter, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, were only for the sense of worship. 
Could you find any rabbinical teaching that would ta- teach this? In other words, then, could you say, uh, hey, you could have a, a little uh, figurine of a bird uh, sitting on your, uh, on your dining room table, and that would not be a problem because it's just art. And, and could you develop the idea that Exodus 20 verse 4 was only you are not to make these in order to worship them? And of course, at these doors, you were not worshiping. Could you build that? Now, I'm not completely sure that you could. Herod in the first temple put an eagle out over the entrance to the temple, and the Jewish people, as soon as they thought Herod was dead, they made a mistake and actually did this a few days earlier, and several people lost their lives because of it uh, in Herod's anger. But uh, they decided, we're taking down this eagle. The eagle wasn't worshipped. Nobody was worshipping the eagle. It was just uh, welcoming the people in. Uh, But uh, uh, the people saw that as breaking the commandments. So could you build... The, 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 the Exodus argument is only for worship. Could you build that argument? Maybe, but I think it would be weak. So how do you reconcile these? One, you reconcile them by saying God told them to do it. Could we do that? Yeah, I don't know. Two, you don't reconcile it. You, reckon, you, you, you keep them separate and say this really shouldn't have happened whether or not God was openly angry with it or whether or not God uh, ever punished them for it, it really shouldn't have happened. And you would take that as, look, here is a point at which Israel, (coughs) excuse me, is diverging from where it should be. And then the third thing is you can say, well, we can reconcile it and we can do so because Exodus 20 verse 4 is not about what they were doing in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse uh, 32. So, it doesn't answer the question. It uh, just gives you three avenues down which to go. Or, as we like to say here, three assumptions. And we'll question the assumptions all along and say, okay, any way in which that could be a, uh, a, uh, a, a true way to go in uh, that. Uh, so, uh, thanks, uh, Jim. I appreciate uh, that uh, good question uh, from uh, Piedmont, South Carolina. And uh, God bless you uh, uh, for that. Okay, let's, uh, let's move in uh, to our next uh, question. Uh, th- this is a follow-up question that comes from Gerard in Belgium, and it's a, a, a question that uh, we had uh, from uh, yesterday or a couple days ago about the resurrected body and whether or not the resurrected body had blood. Now, I said, yes, it does, uh, that it is a, a flesh and blood kind of body in which we live. Now, as we uh, come to the uh, question now, we, uh, we, we um, see the question that uh, says, okay, Gerard says, Dr. Ruckman has some things to say about the glorified body in the ages to come, in the eternal state. Uh, He says, we will no longer have an appetite to sin. Okay, now let's talk about that. Will the resurrected body have an appetite to sin? I think that. I think that there's very few things we can say about the resurrected body. I think that we know that it is... Um, buried, if you will, corruptible, and raised incorruptible. But that's talking about its ability to decay, its ability to to corrupt. Uh, It's not talking about graft and corruption, those kind of things. Will the resurrected body (coughs) not have an appetite to sin? I, I think there's probably pretty good reason to to say the resurrected body does not have this appetite. Uh, But I would go with 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, in which Paul says, now we see through a glass darkly. Then we shall see face to face. I wish I knew. You know, uh, there are some who believe, I don't believe, but there are some who believe you can come to a certain point in your walk 
in which you have overcome an appetite to sin. I don't know that that is uh, necessarily true. I think our appetite for sin changes over the years. Uh, maybe it's because of, uh, uh, you know, that sin bit us too many times. We're not interested in that anymore. Or maybe it's because our energy level has declined. And so therefore we're not, we just don't have the energy for that sin anymore. Whatever it may be, our sins change over the years. But uh, sometimes, you know, one changes out for another and it could be, that uh, our appetite for the things of the flesh has gone away, but now we've just moved into an appetite for, uh, let's say, gossip, uh, that uh, uh, we've, we've moved from uh, sins of the flesh or sins of the mouth or sins of the attitude, whatever it may be. But this is not the issue. The issue is, what about in our resurrected body? Do we have an appetite to sin anymore? I see no indication of the, of the scripture that shows an appetite to sin for the resurrected body. But is it there? Uh, I, I don't really like an argument for silence. I'd like to look at Dr. Dr. Peter Ruckman's uh, argument sometime and see what he built that upon, if, if uh, indeed that was just a, uh, shall we say, a presumption, an assumption that because we do not see it, therefore it is uh, not. And that, that very well could be the case. Uh, thanks, Gerard, in uh, Belgium. I appreciate uh, you uh, bringing up uh, that uh, question there. And uh, uh, God bless you for uh, that. Let's go to Charles in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Says, when I was a good Baptist, I was a sinner saved by grace. Now that you have me rightly dividing, seems to me that 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, God is not imputing my trespasses to, the, to me. Does this imply that I am no longer a sinner. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.19 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And what it says is almost unbelievable. So unbelievable that uh, a lot of Baptists and other pastors don't even want to preach it because it doesn't fit the way we present the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Look right here. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Now, we like to share the gospel by saying, Hey, Charles, thou art a sinner. And you need to deal with this sin. You need to recognize that you're a sinner. You need to repent of the sins. You need to feel sorry for the sins. And this goes, uh, goes against a little bit. Again, this passage of, in, which says that in, in Christ, God was not imputing their trespasses unto them. These were not credited to their account. These were not counted unto them. So how can you say, Charles, you got to deal with this sin problem here, but God is not counting these sins against you. It does become a problem. This is, again, why I think most Baptists and other preachers uh, in uh, evangelicalism, especially, and there is a lot of evangelical garbage, as I once wrote, um, but why they they tend to ignore 2 Corinthians 5.19, which is just the most phenomenal scripture in the New Testament. I think that one little line, not imputing their trespasses against them, that changes everything. This means that God is offering a gift to anyone, man, woman, boy, girl. Now, the Baptist preachers, and I know a lot about being a Baptist preacher because I art one, and uh, the Baptist preachers will... Uh, will uh, uh, on sometimes say, doesn't matter who you are. You might have come in here a drunkard. You can come out of here a, a, a sinner saved by grace. You might have come in here a prostitute. Doesn't matter. God will accept you. He is offering a gift of grace by work, by, by grace through faith, not of works. He is offering it to every man, woman, boy, or girl. But then they want to slip into, oh, but you got to deal with it. you got to recognize it. This thing that God's not counting against you, well, he might not be, but I am. <laughs> now, obviously, they wouldn't uh, use exactly those words. Now, 
do the, <coughs> excuse me, I'm dealing with this uh, cough here, <coughs> but I'll get it. Do, do these words, uh, makes for fine television, doesn't it? Do these words imply that you're not a sinner? No. Uh, I think we could find many places in scripture and even without those places in scripture, we could say, here's the character of God. Charles, do you measure up? I think Charles would be the first to say, no, I don't measure up. Randy would be the first to say, no, Randy doesn't measure up either. And so we, uh, we look at this issue and say, I am a sinner. And as a sinner, I am separated from God. But the gift that God is offering, he is not counting that against me. He is not saying, I am only giving this gift to people who recognize what utter scum they are. I am not going to give this gift if someone has not, uh, you know, repented in sackcloth and ashes. They must first weep real crocodile tears before I am going to give it. I think the issue is the nature of the gift more than the nature of the person. The person, um, sinful. It's interesting that uh, the uh, word in the scripture uh, for someone who commits sin, (coughs) normally uh, translated as sinner, uh, it's always an adjective, whereas sinner is a noun. And so, in in its truest sense, what the Bible is telling us is that Charles is sinful, Randy is sinful, but guess what? God is not imputing their trespasses unto them. And in this then, we rejoice. And... I think this ought to affect the way we share the gospel. I think that uh, there are those who teach us, you know, to share the gospel, you need to say, Charles, are you a good person? Oh, yes, 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 I'm a good person. Well, Charles, uh, uh, the scripture says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And then they'll interpret, they'll, they'll misinterpret this. Uh, did you ever skip church on Sunday? Which has nothing to do with remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, by the way. Did you ever ch- skip church on Sunday? Well, yeah, I guess a few times. Uh, well, you know, Charles, the Bible says, uh, honor thy mother and thy father. Did you ever disobey your mother and father? Oh, yeah, I guess I did. I guess I did once or twice. Well, so you're a Sabbath breaker and, uh, and, uh, and, and you disobey your mother and your father. Did you ever lie, Charles? Well, a few times. Try not to make a habit of it, but a few times. Ah, what do you call a person who's lied? Well, a liar. Are you telling me you are a Sabbath-breaking, disobedient liar, and you call yourself a good person? Oh, I guess I am. I just, I'm like a cockroach. I'm the worst thing there is. Now you can be saved. Now that you realize what a roach you are, now you can be saved. They're trying to teach us to share the gospel like this. And that's not a good news thing that, you know, if I can't convince you what an utter cockroach you are, then I'm sorry, you cannot be saved. I think we have this good news message, this good news message that says, Charles, you may be pure as the driven snow, or you may be the greatest scum that ever walked this earth. But guess what? In the cross of Jesus Christ, he has taken sin, he has nailed it to the cross, <coughs> and God now is offering a gift of salvation to anyone by grace, his grace, through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is a gift of God. It's a gift of God that's available even to you. Would you like to receive it? Would you like to place your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is such a good news message that we have that uh, I think we have to come and uh, uh, look at that and uh, 
uh, begin to share it really then as that good news message. Thanks, uh, Charles. Let's go to uh, Stephen down in Florida. Which books of the Bible, <coughs> excuse me again, which books of the Bible don't have the death of a person or the death of an animal sacrifice mentioned in them. Due to the fact that there are hardly any, if any, books that don't mention a death, I don't find the reading of the Bible very cheery, even though I voraciously study it. Uh, the reason I study the Bible is that I want to figure out who is God's character uh, and uh, who, who this God character is, excuse me, and why he made such a strange and often sad world. Okay, this is an interesting question, just a, a, uh, uh, in, in a real small degree, maybe we'd say it's a, a little bit of a trivia question, not meant like that, but uh, that is there a book in the Bible in which you don't have the death of an animal <coughs> or, uh, or a person? Uh, and uh, let's, um, let's see here. If we were to, um, to think through the scriptures um, on the books of the Bible that don't have a death, uh, Genesis certainly does, almost begins with death, does it not, uh, with uh, Cain and Abel. Uh, so uh, Genesis has uh, certainly got it, and uh, Exodus, yeah, that's got it. Leviticus has got it. Uh, Numbers, uh, Numbers is all about death, all the way, uh, all the way through. Thirty-eight years of death. Deuteronomy is full of sacrifices. Joshua uh, fought the battle of Jericho. Uh, Judges, that's. Uh, uh, a, a period of prosperity followed by death, a period of prosperity followed by death. It's all through there. Uh, the book of Ruth, you've got uh, uh, Ruth's husband herself who dies. Uh, first, second Samuel, those are uh, uh, days of uh, the early days of the, uh, the king. You've got, you got the death of uh, Saul. Uh, you know, that was a suicide in there. It's not very uh, encouraging. First and second Kings, same thing. First and second Chronicles, is uh, just a different perspective, a priestly perspective from what took place in Samuel and Kings. Uh, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, <coughs> you, you've certainly got uh, uh, enemies like Sanballat and Tobias uh, working against the uh, things and the people of God. Uh, the book of Esther, you've got the death of Vashti, uh, the book of Job, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a depressing book there. Psalms, there's plenty of death there. Proverbs, uh, I'm sure you've got some death in the book of Proverbs. Uh, Ecclesiastes, yeah, uh, you know, what, 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 what good is this? Uh, uh, certainly uh, death in there. Song of Solomon, uh, I don't know. I, I, I've, I've taught through the Song of Solomon before. Uh, it's more of a love story. Is there an actual death mentioned in the Song of Solomon? Uh, perhaps uh, the book of uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, full of death. Uh, Hosea, uh, probably, but you certainly got, you got a divorce in there, if not a death. Uh, Joel, the great and terrible day of the Lord. Uh, Amos, O ye cows of Bashan, Bashan. Uh, <clears throat> Obadiah, Jonah. Uh, in Jonah, you've got uh, the repentance. You've got the sackcloth and ashes. Uh, everybody seems to live, and Jonah's kind of bummed out that they all lived. Eh, maybe there's no actual death there. Um, uh, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, I think they're all going to have death and sacrifice in them. Uh, that's just the 39 books of the Old Testament. Now, so here's this 39 books of the Old Testament that can be kind of a bummer to read. Wow, they keep on dying. Uh, it is a strange circumstance. And yet, through every one of those, we could go through also and talk about the hope that is given through those and find what great rejoicing I think that would be in the overall, and, and, and in the fact that this, this sad world that we live in has a Redeemer coming. I'm Dr. Randy White, and this is Ask the Theologian. Looking forward to that Redeemer.
Excellent, Stephen. Thanks for uh, that. You know, you get into the uh, New Testament. Um, probably some some books in the New Testament that don't mention death. Probably, I like a book of Philippians. I'm thinking through, uh, uh, you know, we'd have to look at it a little. Uh, Philippians it tends to be a book of encouragement. Uh, a lot in there that, uh, but even at that, those books uh, consider either the death of Jesus Christ or they consider uh, the, uh, the, the coming uh, destruction onto this world, the coming judgment on this world. Uh, you're, I, th- I think you're right that uh, there is just a lot of uh, uh, death and dying in the scripture. Uh, so yeah, I, I, you know, your point is well taken. Though, though some might, might have a problem with your point. Uh, you, you say, I don't find the reading of the Bible very cheery, even though I voraciously study it, and we've uh, seen enough of your questions to know that you do. Uh, <clears throat> some seem to think, oh, you can't, you can't say that. You, you, you can't say that the Bible's not cheery. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And uh, there's sort of this artificial uh, cleaning up of some of these passages of Scripture that, that is done. And when you read the Bible, uh, Madison was talking about this the other day, working with the children. Uh, there are some of these things that uh, you're dealing with. In fact, uh, she's teaching the kids this Sunday, uh, Hagar and Ishmael. Um, and... Uh, you know, when you're dealing with first graders, uh, there's some parts of that story you're like, I don't know if I just really want to put all that out there for a first grader. It's kind of a, a PG-13 book in a sense. Uh, so when we, when we deal with it with reality, it is, uh, <coughs> to borrow from Stephen's words there, a, a strange and often sad world that we live in. Um, now, I would question the assumption. I, you know, I read it to see why he made such a strange and often sad world. I would, I would word that just a little differently. I read it to, to uh, see why the world he made is so strange and so sad, uh, is the way that I uh, think I would have uh, put that uh, there. I appreciate uh, that. Uh, and if you do that three times, Nathan, it uh, for some reason uh, works sometimes four times. If you keep at it enough, it works. We're, we're talking about a little coding issue that we seem to be having today. But I did go through it as uh, you stepped out of the room earlier and eventually uh, get there. <laughs> okay, now um, we uh, will uh, go on to uh, uh, the next question. Ah, um, We're going to see. Scott, you've got a question about key scriptures supporting the right division. I, I, might, I might save that. I don't like to save over the weekend, so I may come back to it, but that's such a good TV question uh, that I'm going to hold it for just a moment. Let's uh, go down to Sarasota. What do you think about temporary punishment? Now, here... We are talking, uh, at, at no doubt. Uh, that, well, let, let's 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 lay out the uh, issues that we could uh, we could be talking about. There is, a, let's just say, an <laughs> while you are <coughs> while you are alive, earthly kind of punishment, and <coughs> that uh, particular punishment. We were even looking at last night in Colossians. End of chapter uh, 3, chapter 3, verse 25, that says, But he that doeth wrong shall receive wrong for which he hath done, and there is no respect of uh, persons. I connected that with while while you are alive. Every time I say the golf's getting better, it uh, comes back, typically when the camera's on. Um, Okay, so... But I don't think that's the uh, temporary punishment that <laughs> that we are talking about. <clears throat> I, I do think there is a natural 
law, if you will, and God made natural laws, uh, that uh, a man sows what he reaps, Galatians chapter 6. Uh, so in that, in that sense, yeah, okay, temporary punishment. However, I suspect this is talking about more, <coughs> more of a, uh, a purgatory kind of punishment. Uh, and uh, before we uh, go there, let me remind you of this sermon while I cough. There, how's that? Since, since Nathan hasn't made me a cough button yet, I just went to there. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, so uh, I, I think this question on temporary punishment has to do with more uh, in, after death, temporary punishment after death. We could call it a purgatory kind of a situation in which you go to a purgatory, you experience a temporary punishment, and then you are finally let out of that punishment. Now, we should say, of course, it's the Catholics that uh, promote the idea of purgatory. Uh, the Catholics would build that off of a scriptural base. They don't just say, we didn't like eternal punishment, and so we made up purgatory. Uh, no, they would, they would point out scriptures that would point to a purgatory kind of experience. Now, I think that any time you build a biblical argument for temporary punishment, and those who teach universalism, they end up having to do this because there's just too much punishment after death in the Bible. They can't just ignore it all and say nobody is ever punished. So a universalist has to deal with those scriptures. They're not going to deal with those scriptures as eternal punishment because then they couldn't be a universalist and they are so hell-bent on being a universalist that uh, they, will, they, they will throw away their own right division to say, I'm going to be a universalist. And that is the uh, the, 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 the tail that wags the dog then. Now, uh, so you build a purgatory argument and, and temporary punishment, even though the, uh, the universalists who are not Catholics would not call it purgatory. It's the same thing. Uh, so universalists who have some degree of respect for the Bible believe in purgatory. They call it something else. What do I think about that? I think that you have to build it off Sheol passages because Sheol is the only place that you see this temporary punishment. Sheol is the grave. And so they will take passages. Here's, here's what they do. I am a right divider. I believe that uh, the Apostle Paul has written that which is to us. Now, let me tell you about people who die today by going back here to the book of Psalms. And they throw away their right division. Poof! Woo! Gone with the wind. There it is. And so they are either... Uh, they're either liars about being a right divider... Or they're, 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 they're intellectually, they're either intellectually dishonest or they're intellectually duped. I don't know which one you want to choose. Because you, you, I, I don't think you can build when you rightly divide and say, okay, what happens to a guy in Sarasota, Florida today if he dies without Christ? Well, we go back here to 1 Kings and we say, wait, I, no, no, I'm not talking about 1 Kings. 1 Kings doesn't talk about how he's saved and how he's lost and how any of that stuff. 1 Kings is not germane in this. So to build, my, my point is, what do you think about temporary punishment? I think that, uh, that uh, there were dispensations in which there was some temporary punishment and uh, that it was, uh, it was uh, uh, done and provided uh, for in Sheol. And I think to apply it to today's dispensation is to throw out the gospel. The gospel is there is uh, a, a gift that is offered 
to people who are damned to eternal separation. And that is the gift that God is offering. God is not offering a gift to people who are going to have to go to seven years of purgatory. And he's saying, hey, I can cut that down to three and a half years. Boy, what a bargain I got here. So my my uh, my thought here, and by the way, this guy Rodney Ballou out in Connecticut, he's, uh, he's spitting out all this garbage on this. And his, his, uh, his, his theological argument goes against everything he's ever said about being a right divider. He does not rightly divide. He mixes it and mashes it in order to, to, to continue this universalist uh, 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 propaganda that he adopted from, I don't know, Ellen G. White or something. I don't know where he got it. He, uh, he got it from not being being a right divider. And when you're not a right divider, you'll either get into evangelical garbage or right division garbage. There's right division garbage. It all comes when you don't rightly divide or fundamentalist garbage or uh, a church, a church of Christ scientist garbage or whatever. It all comes from taking the scriptures and not rightly dividing it. I've been listening to this book and the only reason I got it on the audio, uh, audio, audible, uh, uh, audio books, whatever it is, only reason I got it is because uh, I thought that'll be bad. <laughs> that'll be bad. That'll be so bad. I I I I just want to get some popcorn and sit back for the show and see how bad this is. Uh, and it was uh, it's about <coughs> about uh, uh, reading the uh, uh, reading the gospel or reading the Bible through um, through Western eyes. Uh, let me see. Uh, misreading scripture with Western eyes. That's the name of it. Uh, re removing cultural blindness to better understand the Bible. Now, <clears throat> I've only listened to uh, the first uh, two chapters, and it is as I suspected. Uh, it is. Um, I had to check the title there. That's why I pulled my phone. Um, it, it basically is saying, oh, sin isn't really sin. The Bible, the Bible doesn't really talk about all these things. You just misread that through your uh, Western eyes. And chiefly, it was those fundamentalists down south who caused you to read the Bible like that. But that's not really what it says. Uh, so I, I knew that it was um, uh, going to be a liberal book in conservative clothes right from the beginning. And that's exactly what it is. They, they, I, I've, I've seen this uh, yakety yak too many times. Well, whether it's them or some other uh, uh, putting aside to build this theology <coughs> based upon uh, some other dispensation, and this is what, it, and, and all of the scriptures so far in that misreading scripture with Western eyes, everything I look is like, hey, it wasn't your Western eyes that caused that. It was your covenant theology that caused it. That's why you misread scriptures because your covenant theology uh, and uh, covenant theology, I think, just is is utterly wrong. There, there, there is no covenant of grace. Now, universalists who have to, if again, if they have any respect for scripture at all, they have to have a temper. They have to have purgatory because there's there's too much afterlife punishment that is dealt with in the scripture. So they have to make that into purgatory. So become a Catholic, uh, I guess. You know, if you wanna, if you wanna hold to uh, 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 temporary punishment, at least the Catholics have worked it out in a, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, systematic doctrine. Just become a Catholic. Uh, you've, you've abandoned it anyway. Abandon the, the scripture rightly divided anyway. So just become a Catholic. Um, and, um, you know, carry it out that way. Uh, thanks. I appreciate that. Now, and, and by the way, that may not have anything to do with uh, old uh, Rodney in Connecticut, uh, but he's, he's one of the uh, chief uh, 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 proclaimers of universalism right now among those of us who study the Bible. Um, and, and I don't know if, he, if he's got dementia or if he's drunk or uh, if he uh, made a compact with the devil or if he just decided one day, I don't like the Bible, I don't like right division, or if he was just dumb as a box of rocks and, uh, and never knew what he was talking about. In the, I, don't, I don't really know. Uh, because I honestly, I've watched maybe three sermons that he's ever done and, and I don't plan to watch anymore really, uh, uh, uh through all that. Okay. Thanks uh, for that, uh, question. 
uh, through that. Uh, incident. Well, let me say one more thing. Rodney's one of these that uh, he won't let you comment. He's, you go, you all go on in the comments right now, and uh, you know you can say, "Hey, I think Randy White's drunk and dementia and everything." Say whatever you want. I don't, I don't care. Put a good argument out there. I don't care, Rodney. And this, this is what has to happen when you become a cult leader. You say, "Don't you say that? Don't you say that? Don't you say that? I'll block you right now. Block. I already did because I am right." I think that is such a despicable uh, attitude to have. I got an attitude too. I think that's a despicable attitude to have when it comes to dealing with the scripture. Let's deal with it rough and tough, but let's deal with it. Let's look at it and let's look somebody, you know, in the whites of the eye and say, no, you got it wrong. Here's where you got it wrong and why you got it wrong. But when we cut off conversation because it hurts our feelings, well, come on, grow up, man. Don't get a YouTube channel if you can't handle somebody disagreeing with you. Just, just, you know, if you need people to just pat you on the back and tell you what a wonderful person you are, go down and join the mega church. They'll pat you on the back all day long. Go, go sit with Joel Osteen. But if you want to try to teach the scripture and you want to do it publicly, put it out there. Let them, let them uh, shoot the darts, crucify you, whatever. And I say that even to uh, you know, uh, uh, other, other, other friends who have YouTube channels out there, quit blocking the comments, quit closing those off, but they say things that aren't true. Well, so do you. And so do I, somebody ought to call it on it. I, I get emails all the time or comments on YouTube all the time. And, and, uh, you know, some of them, I just say, you and I are in such a different world, universe. We're not going to understand each other. Others. I say, I should have said that better. Or I say, golly, I never thought about that. <laughs> and, and it's a good thing. It's an open thing. Put it out there. So again, that's a challenge to all Bible teachers on the internet. I see this more with Bible teachers than anyone else. Uh, you know, they, you, 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 I don't know. I look at some gardening channels. They never, they never block the comments in the gardening channel. And you read those and they say, all the, no, you should never do that to your tomatoes. You, well, well, I, but tomato growers have, a, have more of a spine than Bible teachers do. Bible teachers, I don't know, they get so uh, offended if somebody should uh, disagree with them. Did I get off topic? <laughs> Thanks, Sarasota, for uh, the uh, question there. I appreciate uh, appreciate. That, um, I think our, our three times is up to six, Nathan. Um, okay. He says he's fixing it. So I can go on to the next question. <laughs> uh, <coughs> and, uh, now I think you're going to mess up if you go to the next question, because it's not going to automatically feed and then you're going to have a problem. It's just my personal comment because I send out the uh, the the weekly update today, and if you don't get them all in to ask the theologian, then in a minute I'm going to be saying, "Where are they? Where are they? Where are they?" So you need to make sure that gets completed. That's what I'm thinking there. Uh, <laughs> but if you don't think so, I'll go on. Uh, so you got to have a spine to work around here. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's, uh, let's go, uh, to, um, you know, Nancy, <coughs> excuse me, um, oh, <laughs> okay, I got a, I got a couple here, uh, but I think I lost one there, Nathan. Uh, but maybe not. I thought I had another one coming up that I was about to do, but... Uh, Nancy said, uh, I'm late. Did Randy answer my question? I'm wondering if I'm really saved. Uh, let's... Uh, 
let me let me go back to uh, to that, and and, and it already uh, has has uh, gone up. What <coughs> what Nancy <coughs> was talking about? Excuse me. <coughs> <clears throat> what, what Nancy was talking about is she said, I was saved under the, uh, the Roman road. And it's kind of what we were talking about earlier uh, when, you know, the Roman road, uh, it, it, it early on says, you know, uh, you're a, you, uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you recognize that you're a sinner and uh, carry that out? Uh, and uh, do, so, so under that, very common evangelical pretense, Nancy receives the gospel that was presented to her. Was she saved? I believe yes, because ultimately, even though they put up a lot of hurdles for Nancy to get to it, ultimately, she placed her faith in Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what I did and what so many of you did for many years, I was, you know, your standard Southern Baptist pastor, and uh, I taught the gospel this way. And uh, for a lot of years, you know, I'd go door to door and uh, on Sunday afternoons, you know, knock on the door, say, hey, uh, what do you think it takes for a person to go to heaven? If I could ask you a, <coughs> a question there, and, you know, they'd say, well, you got to be a good person. And I said, well, can I share with you a different answer? I think it's all in faith, F-A-I-T-H. And, and uh, F is for forgiveness. God offers forgiveness. And uh, forgiveness is A. A is for available. I is for impossible. It's impossible for you uh, to... Uh, uh, be saved any other way. T is for turn. You got to turn. You got to quit. You got to repent. Except you repent, you will all likewise perish. H is for heaven. Heaven is your home someday. Would you like to come in faith? And so my the, the my my presentation of the gospel included the T turn. Now were those people saved? Yes. Uh, I had a poor presentation of the gospel. But I would go back to uh, that word that says uh, it is by the foolishness of preaching that God saves some. It, it leads them to, uh, to, to place their faith in Jesus Christ. If we believe in a, um, uh, a, a gospel of grace, surely we can believe that God saves those who... Uh, place their faith in him, but have a lot of confusion going on in them. I am not one, <coughs> one, and they're out there, uh, I'm not one <coughs> that says, if you don't understand the word like I understand the word, then you are not even saved. I'm just one that says, uh, hey, I was saved for a long time not really understanding the word and what a difference it made when I came to understand the word. I think the gospel is all the sweeter now that uh, I understand it uh, in this uh, rightly divided uh, way. I, uh, I, I, I appreciate uh, that. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for that. Uh, let's see, DL, uh, and th this, is a, this is a good, uh, uh, a good reason to have comments. DL says, why do you pick on a particular member of the body of Christ? Don't forget, Rodney's your brother. He sees through a foggy glass just like you. What gives you the right to be the keeper of the faith? Nothing. Nothing. Uh, I am not the keeper of the faith. I am a student of the word. I am a fellow student of the word. And if I see uh, Rodney Ballou or Joel Osteen or uh, Ellen G. White uh, or uh, uh, you, you, you name it, uh, John Travolta, if I see them teaching the word in a way that I see it differently, I think this is what brothers do. They say, hey, you got this wrong. And they don't say, oh, <laughs> I don't say anything. It, when, when Joel Osteen gets it wrong, we say it wrong. When Rodney Ballou gets it wrong, we say it wrong. When Randy White gets it wrong, you, sh you should get it wrong. And we should be able to do it again face-to-face, eye-to-eye, not hiding it. 
Uh, so why pick on a particular member of Christ? Because he's the one that's teaching the garbage that, uh, that, that was in the question. Now, if it's a different question, I may pick on another member of the body of Christ, or I may pick generally, or I may, uh, I may just speak to the issue at hand. But I do think that the absolute wrong thing to do is never call names. Paul, why did you pick on Alexander the coppersmith like that? Why did you call out a name? I mean, Alexander just sees through foggy glasses just like you. Who made you the keeper of the faith? Well, Paul was the keeper of the faith. Randy White is not the keeper of the faith. And I think that if, uh, if for, for those who say Randy White got it wrong, they ought to, as, as clearly, as publicly, as loudly as they can, they ought to say, Randy White, you got it wrong. And I'll look at that. I'm not going to block them. I'm, if they start cussing, that's when I block them out. Okay, you don't need to cuss to, to, to do all that. But, uh, but, but I think that uh, we, none of us are the keeper of the faith. All of us, in a sense, are the defender of the faith. But even more than that, we're all students of the Word of God. Now, imagine that we're scientists, okay? And we're, uh, you know, our job is to invent... Um, uh, you know, a new uh, defense system that is going to uh, protect our nation from uh, uh, missiles that come abroad. That's our job. They've, they've assigned it to us. Uh, do it. Uh, and two fellow scientists come together. And one says we need to build an iron fence. And the other says, no, an iron fence is not going to work. We need to build an electronic fence. Now, do, your, your, your two brothers in science, do, should they, boom, should they go at it as clear as day? Absolutely, definitely, yes, no doubt about it. Should they do it to the point they might be yelling and screaming and spitting at each other? I don't care if that's what it takes to get the thing across. I am more concerned about the truth than I am concerned about this thing we've got in the church today that says, be nice, be nice to everybody. Let's all be nice. I think the nice thing is let's, let's study the truth. And I could and would have a very direct conversation with Rodney. He can come on my program anytime. I'll be happy to um, debate him about the issues. It would be a debate, no doubt about it. And if, and if he called it wrong, I'm going to say, you called it wrong. And here's where I think you called it wrong. I do that with DL or Bob or Michael or whatever it is. Uh, so, so I disagree with the idea that, uh, you know, why, why pick on a particular member of the body of Christ? Because he's teaching the thing that I'm teaching against. That's why. And because he's pulling a lot of people over there. There are probably some unknown guy that I don't know, and he's just studying in his mother's basement or something on it. And I, I you know, I don't, I'm not picking against him. Well, I might if I knew about it and if he was having influence. And I think I should. Uh, you know, politicians, um, Americans have a, a love hate with. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Mudslinging, dirty politics. And uh, you, you got, let's say, um, I don't know, you got uh, Mitt Romney out there. And, and if you're a true conservative, you don't like Mitt Romney. Now, if I was in Utah running for Senate uh, against Mitt Romney in the primary, I would, I would call Mitt Romney what he is. He's a sheep in sheep's clothing. That's what he is. The sheep in sheep's clothing. I'm not interested in having a sheep lead me. That guy will never go up against anything. Uh, you you, you want to kill babies? Well, it's not for me, but let me move by while you go and slaughter the innocents. Go ahead. He's a sheep in sheep's clothing. If I was running against him, I would point out everywhere the guy should have had a backbone and some leadership, and he should have done something, and he didn't. I think that's what politicians are supposed to do. That's why they're running a public race out there. What's wrong with theologians doing it? What's wrong with mathematicians doing it? Grammarians doing it? But, uh, I, I, think, I think that's what, uh, what we got to do when we, uh, when we carry those uh, things out. Uh, 
Now, now uh, going on in the comment, I think uh, Christ's body is big enough for Rodney as well as for you. No doubt about it. Uh, you don't know for sure that you've been given more light than Rodney. Christ is the head, not you. Stop tearing down your brothers. I'm not tearing down my brothers. He's probably a wonderful guy. Maybe drunk, maybe dementia, maybe, uh, but, but, but he is not teaching the word rightly divided. Now, he may come and say, and he can, and he has his own program. It's just that he would not let you mention, you can't comment on his program. Huh? Ah! Why? Because he's keeper of the faith, I guess. Go, go, try to, try to do it on his Facebook page. J just as an experiment on his, on his Facebook or on his YouTube, anything else. Uh, anywhere you can find a place to comment, which are very few, but you just try to, as an experiment, Say, say the slightest disagreement. You will be shut off in a New York minute. I don't shut you off because I think that you've got some good comments to bring. Now, is Christ's body big enough for both of us? Yes, definitely. Is Rodney saved? Yes, if he has trusted in the, in the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's saved. Can a saved brother teach that which is damnable? Absolutely. Should we just say, ah, but we're brothers. We, we, let, we let brothers say that which is damnable. No, we don't. And you call me out for it. And, uh, and I'm, I'm good with that. I, I, I think that, yeah, there, there needs to be that calling out saying, hey, are you sure you're right here? Are you, you, you need to rethink this. Uh, do you think maybe you've been given more light than Rodney? I don't think I have. I, I'm just going from uh, the word of God rightly divided. He's going from the word of God not divided. And that makes a different perspective. The reason he is a universalist believing in purgatory is because he gets his eternal ideas from places outside of the dispensation of grace. I see where he's coming from. That's just wrong. And just like we would speak against uh, uh, teaching the gospel from the book of Ezekiel, I think we ought to teach of what about eternal punishment from the book of Ezekiel. It doesn't, uh, doesn't pertain to those of us who are uh, living today. Um, so, uh, good, good uh, conversation. I appreciate that. And, uh, Deal, you are welcome here anytime to uh, um, uh, condemn me as bold as you would like. Um, and uh, I'm not scared of it. I can uh, handle it. And, uh, and it's, the, it's the ideas. You say, stop tearing down a brother. Uh, I, 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 I've, I've never met the guy, and he's never met me. Uh, <coughs> and, you know, probably he's a nice guy. If we went to Connecticut, we might have some clam chowder or whatever they eat in Connecticut and sit down and have a nice meal together. But tearing down a brother... I don't think I am. I think I'm tearing down a brother's idea. And this is what brothers do. Brother, that idea is not going to hold water. That idea doesn't work. You've got, you've got an assumption that's wrong. And uh, uh, so uh, that's, uh, that, that's uh, where you are. Okay. Um, a, uh, a, little, uh, a little word uh, going uh, through there. Um, and, um, uh, that's, that's a good comment. Would you allow a brother to poison himself? Yeah. Um, excellent. Okay. Um, I'm out of time. But, but, but there's a follow-up to that previous question about death in the Bible. <coughs> Said I didn't want to bias your answer, but off the top of my head, I thought Philemon was the. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I get it out here. <coughs> and I'm not even smoking. I thought Philemon was the only book where uh, they don't specifically mention death, even though they do mention Christ. It could be true. It would be, it would be an interesting thing to actually go through. You know, I just went through in a very quick, haphazard, 
you're right in Philemon. Uh, I don't think death is mentioned. Uh, uh, I actually have a commentary coming out of it on it on uh, Titus and Philemon. I'm trying to remember in Titus. Uh, too much to remember there. Um, yeah, we we'll we'll have to check that out and see uh, if we can uh, put uh, figure all that out. Okay. Um, the, uh, <laughs> we don't need an iron fence, but an iron dome to stop the Russian hypersonic ICBM. Soon developed in upcoming August of this year. Hopefully you've heard of this development uh, together with UK signing up a mutual defense uh, treaty with Finland and Sweden. We're surely on battle speed, soon to be going ramming speed. You know, I, I think that, <coughs> that uh, <coughs> we very well could be that uh, World War III has already started and we just didn't quite put the start date early enough. Uh, and uh, Ronald Reagan was... Uh, insightful on this. Remember when they mocked him for Star Wars uh, because he was putting this this uh, Iron Dome, this shield. Uh, it wasn't called Iron Dome then. Uh, it was uh, called Star Wars. But uh, this, uh, this defensive shield over us. And he was developing this. Oh, man, the Democrats mocked him for that. Oh, <laughs> what a doofus. Thank you, Ronald Reagan for uh, getting uh, started on that. And, uh, and, and, and now Israel has the Iron Dome, which has been so successful. It was the Ronald Reagan policy, basically, is what Israel's Iron Dome is. And, and I think you're right. Uh, uh, as, uh, that's, 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 that's the, uh, in, in my opinion, that's the new, uh, the new Manhattan Project, is how do you stop not only intercontinental ballistic missiles, but even uh, bullets and tanks. You know, so many of these airplanes, they work on electronics. Uh, well, I know how good electronics work. You stick one little bad letter in and boom, the thing doesn't work. The Manhattan Project of, of uh, 2023 really needs to be looking at those, how can we stop the tank? How can we stop the airplane? How can we stop the ICBM? Even how can we stop the bullet? Uh, and, uh, and looking at those things and just stopping the enemy dead in his tracks. But you can't just stop them and let them stay there because they'll just, uh, uh, they'll code better uh, and come back next year. You, you, you have to also take some defensive measures in addition to uh, offensive. Okay, it's been a good fun Friday the 13th here uh, as uh, we've been... Uh, uh, what, uh, 82% snarky? We haven't done our snarky meter in a long time. 82% snarky, I believe, is what the snarky meter came out to do uh, today. And uh, very glad each one of you are here. Thanks for staying over the uh, extra minutes. Look forward to seeing you again on uh, Sunday, should Christians fast. We're going to look at the scripture rightly divided uh, for that and have a great time. And uh, I'll send out later today the uh, the week in review. If you haven't been getting one of those, send me an email, randy at randywhiteministries.org. I'll sign you up for that. And uh, we will uh, take care of that and have a good time uh, doing so. And uh, again, uh, thanks for always being here with us. I am uh, grateful. Thanks for your comments. Cheers, jeers whatever they may be. Always good to see you and uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. God bless you.